Hello guys, Winston here. Anyone who's followed me online has probably realized by now that I don't rock climb, but I have friends who do and one of them requested a custom nut tool. For those not in the know, nuts or chocks in rock climbing are wedges placed in a rock face to act as anchors. A nut tool helps to remove these. There are plenty of examples of these tools available for sale, but my friend had a few modifications in mind to make this better suited for her. Before I dive into what those changes were though, I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning repository with over 22,000 courses available across a wide range of topics. They can't teach you how to rock climb, but there are plenty of other ways to benefit from an online class at Skillshare and I'll share some of them later on in the video. Back to the project though, my friend wanted a tool that was about an inch longer than what was commonly available to make it easier to reach into deep crevices. She wanted something lightweight since rock climbing is all about fighting gravity, and pointed me towards the Metolius Feather Nut Tool as sort of a baseline product to emulate. I warned her upfront though that the wire gate wasn't something I had the time or experience to integrate and she was fine with eliminating that design feature to simplify the fabrication process. One thing I immediately noticed about the Metolius tool was its use of 7075 aluminum which is harder than the more prevalent 6061 alloy. So I decided to follow suit and manufacture a tool from the same grade of aluminum. After iterating on some designs in my notebook, I went to Fusion to model this thing out. For the business end of my nut tool, I primarily used straight line segments to define the hook and its transition into the handle. Once I was past the neck, I switched to splines to create a more organic shape and some finger conforming contours. I extruded this profile out to a thickness of 0.1 inches. My friend had a steel nut tool that I could reference and that one measured about 0.07 or 0.08 inches thick, so increasing the thickness by 20 thou for an aluminum variant seemed prudent. Then I added in some reinforcement around the outer edges of the handle. You want a nut tool to have a slender nose to get into tight spaces but also a sturdy spine that won't bend. Using the same principles found in an I-beam is a great way to do this. Wrapping the reinforcement band around the back end is also easier on your hands if you need to push or pry a nut loose. I added some cutouts for reducing weight and boosting the cool factor by creating an offset contour and partitioning it off into discrete holes. I saved a small band in the middle to engrave my logo and my friend's initials. By putting this bit of customization here under the protective overhang of the structural reinforcement, the engraving is protected from dings and scratches. And finally, I applied chamfers to all my edges. Not only does this tool need to feel good in hand, but you also don't want it to accelerate wear and tear on your other equipment or ropes that this tool might rub against. With my part modeled, I could begin shopping for material. I hit the internet and started looking for some quarter inch stock that would be long enough to machine a 9.5 inch long tool from. Though I was initially looking at sheets that were 12 inches wide, I discovered Amazon carried 2 inch bar stock that provided the cheapest volume of 7075 at a thickness of a quarter inch. This part would easily fit within the dimensions of that stock. Except, as soon as I began laying out the cam, I started wondering if I could fit two of these tools in a single setup. And well, it turns out I could, but it would be a little sketchy. I decided to give it a try nonetheless. The order of operations was as follows. Rough out the part from the top using an adaptive clear and an eighth inch end mill. Use pockets and contours to true up as much of the part as possible. Use a parallel operation to shape the tapered parts of the tool. Then, since I hate slotting deeper than the diameter of my cutter in aluminum, I use the 8th inch end mill to cut out the first tenth of an inch of my outer profile. Next, I would come in with a 1 16th inch end mill to cut out everything the 8th inch couldn't get to. Then, I would continue my cutout contour to the halfway point of my stock. Since the 8th inch tool had cleared a wide, shallow channel already, only a very short length of my 1 16th inch end mill needed to be in contact with the aluminum on both sides. For this contour, I would sprinkle in a generous amount of tabs. Next, I would use a 90 degree V-bit to engrave my logo and also chamfer all the horizontal edges. For the tapering portions of the nut tool where there was a 3D chamfer, I'd employ a scallop toolpath with a ball end mill. Probably not ideal, but it seemed like an okay idea at the time. On the flip side, I would adaptive clear as much as possible. Then I would use the 1 16th inch end mill to complete the cutout of the part. The V-bit would come back to play to engrave my friend's initials and also chamfer the edges. The scallop toolpath would finish everything off. In the garage, I first machined an MDF platform on which I could use pins for indexing. Then I carefully cut myself an 11 inch slice of 7075 bar stock on the miter saw. I fed slowly and used a little lubricant to help out the saw blade. Though it cut cleanly and produced consistent chips, I could definitely feel the increased resistance pushing through 7075 versus 6061. I mounted my stock on my MDF platform and used two clamps to secure it. 
I knew there was a risk of the material deflecting on me as I cut, but it was a risk worth taking if I could get two pieces out of a single length of stock. The first adaptive cut using my 6061 recipe was a disaster. A 0.1 inch depth of cut was a little too much for my poor shape Oka. I got some pretty heavy chatter almost immediately. With a more rigid machine and stronger stock, it wouldn't be a problem, but this isn't an industrial grade machine and my work holding was admittedly pretty sketchy. I settled for a much safer 35 thou depth of cut and 35 thou optimal load. By the way, for these operations, I'm using an uncoated 8th inch end mill from Carbide 3D. Really nothing special. My inventory of coated 8th inch end mills is pretty much exhausted and I haven't had a chance to restock yet. But I just wanted to point this out to show you guys that there's nothing wrong with using general purpose tooling to cut aluminum. After the adaptive toolpath, I noticed some chatter marks on my part from the very first cut attempt. The 10 thou of axial stock to leave hadn't been enough of a buffer against the machine vibrations in the Z direction. My hope was that enough of that blemish would be removed during later operations. By the time I switched to a 16th inch end mill, I was pretty optimistic that no one would ever have to know about that screw up. But then, when it came time to engrave, I noticed that something was amiss. That chamfer was much larger than I'd planned on it being. Having been on the receiving end of stock movement in my aluminum drink coaster project last year, I knew about how removing material could release internal strain in extruded or rolled stock. But seeing that reality taking shape before me was still an unpleasant realization. This late in the game, I wouldn't be able to compensate for the bowing in my stock, so I had to press on. The blunted engravings and fat chamfers were here to stay. The scallop operations were similarly affected by the raised stock. The ball end mill plunged to the depth it was programmed to, but it met the uplifted aluminum prematurely and gouged its face. Under any other circumstance, I would be agonizing over this defect, but the truth of the matter is that these nut tools were meant to be prototypes. There are so many unknowns when designing a product for the first time. I didn't know if this tool would be long enough or strong enough, or if it had missing features that would become apparent once it was used. The pieces I'm cutting here will be tested and critiqued, and only after I get the thumbs up from my friend will I put my full efforts into machining a perfect article. After flipping over my stock and using the pins to realign it, I ran the reverse side operations. And this time, my chatter problems were exaggerated even more since the stock had been weakened by material removal. Because of the small margins around my part, I wasn't comfortable using clamps in the middle of the stock, so I just had to suffer through listening to the chatter as I went through my 8th inch end mill operations. That sound still gives me nightmares. As the part got weaker and weaker, it deflected more and more. The pocket ops I used to finish the face of my tool left ugly marks and an uneven texture. As soon as that wrapped up though, I realized that my subsequent tool paths could be grouped by whether or not they touched the inside or the outside of my part. This let me selectively use screws or clamps to add additional rigidity to my setup. The engraving and chamfering operations went off a lot better. And with that, I was through the worst part of the project. Could I have used a better sequence of toolpads to machine these parts with less chatter and less part deflection? Absolutely. For starters, I could have used containment boundaries from the beginning to work the inside and outside of my parts separately so that I could apply different work holding tricks like what I learned in the reverse side operations. This would have let me keep the middle of my stock clamped down at all times. And an even better solution than that? Start off with wider stock. I had zero margin around my parts that could have been clamped. A little more planning and a little extra stock would have made this process so much easier and allowed me to realize the material usage efficiency I had so desperately wanted to achieve. But without throwing myself at this machining exercise head on, I wouldn't have learned where these opportunities for improvement existed, so I'm glad I put in the time to try. After liberating my prototypes using a cutoff wheel, I sanded my tabs off and did a little hand sanding to smooth out some of the more pronounced machining marks. Then, to hide my crimes, I pulled out the old Harbor Freight Air Eraser with 220 grit abrasive media. This serves two purposes. The first is for aesthetics. I eventually want to make one of these clear anodized, so I need a way to obscure machining marks. But, by texturing the surface, I also improve the adhesion of any finishes that might be applied. For these prototypes, I'm just using spray paint. The paint will get scratched up with use, but that's alright for a test article. 
For the final version, I'll probably end up doing a powder coat over an anodized finish unless someone has a colored anodizing order that I could piggyback my parts onto. And with that, I called these parts finished. By the time you're seeing this video, I'll have shipped them out to my friend for testing. By opting to try and fit two tools in one setup, I pretty much found the limits of what my material and my machine could handle, and that was honestly super educational for me. It completely changed how I'll approach the cam process when I get around to making the final version of this part, because right now, with how I need to tiptoe around the fragility of my setup, there's no way to make this part efficiently or reliably. But even if I did dial in my machine and my toolpaths to knock out these parts as fast as a Shapeoko could manage, it would never really make sense for me to do so. It's almost impossible for me to bring the price point of this part down below $20 to make this tool competitive against what's on the open market. And because of that fact, I'm grateful for today's sponsor Skillshare for supporting this video and allowing me the creative freedom to pursue ideas like this that make no financial sense whatsoever. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of courses in design, technology, art, and more. One particular category of courses that interests me is business and entrepreneurship, since I'm still working on developing my own brand, identity, and purpose. If you're like me and could use some guidance into how to set yourself up for success and build the right habits, some of these courses on Skillshare might be right for you. A premium membership to Skillshare is extremely affordable at just $10 a month, but right now the first 500 people who use the link in the description below can get two months of membership for free, no strings attached. So go check them out, you just might learn something useful. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back with more CNC-related content in about two weeks.